Have you ever struggled with your garden, growing your garden, and you just struggle? Soil is the building block and the foundation of having a successful garden. Today we're going to talk about building that success using good soil and good soil tactics, making sure that you got everything in line, got all your fundamentals covered so that you can be successful growing your own food. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Hey, I'm Greg. I'm Sheila. And we're talking about soil today. Soil's very important, as we and you and I both know. Mm -hmm. Success and defeat all in the same thing. It starts with your soil. Happy plants, happy soil. Happy plants, happy soils. The old saying is this right here. Organic fertilizers feed the soil, synthetic fertilizers feed the plants, and that is so true right there. And we're going to touch on that just a little bit today too, organic versus conventional. We're going to talk about building blocks of your soil, and what about contamination? Yeah. Contamination is a big one right that's, now. That's a big topic. I've yep. seen a lot of that happen. Compost contamination is widespread and something that you need to be aware of, so we're going to talk about that as well. But first of all... Wow, we got a bunch of stuff growing What you on. got there? This is something I've grown before. I didn't grow this one. Carrie grew this. This is Chinese okra. Oh, yeah, we ate that. Mm -hmm. So she brought this in, and I told her, I said, it's an ideal stage to eat it. So what you do is you cut it up just like you would okra, batter it, and fry it. And there you have mm -hmm. Chinese. It's actually, folks, it's a loofah. But, uh, is this what you call mountain okra? Mm hmm. Yep. So if you let it get bigger, Lufa, it's a lufa. It's a lufa. Yeah. So it's a dual purpose, you might say. But uh, yeah, good one. Area. A lot of people up in the mountains call this vine okra. Oh, vine. Okay. Yeah, mountain okra, vine okra, it's the same thing. Uh, I wrote a blog years ago about this right here. The first time I found it was in Jamestown, Tennessee. And it's interesting if you want to look at vine okra, that blog will probably come up somewhere. It talks about my experience finding this right here at an older lady's garden in the middle of nowhere in Jamestown, Tennessee. The cool. vine orchid, if you, it grows on a vine just like a regular gourd does, because it is a gourd, and uh, it's a good food source, so something different. Mm. What else we got going on? Yeah. I've been fermenting peppers. Yeah. See those bubbles come up? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, pepper harvest is in excess right now, so yeah. everybody's trying to figure out how to use those excess peppers. So about three weeks ago, uh -huh. I started some fermenting and to make me some pepper sauce. Um, now, most people don't ferment pepper sauce, but some people do. And is that your preferred way of doing it? Uh, it's the shelf life is a lot longer. Yeah. Um, the only pepper sauce I've ever done before is to take the little hot peppers and pour vinegar in it. And so I'll have a video coming out how to actually make this. Um, I'll let you taste it. Yeah. This is on some uh, cream cheese, cheese and, and a little bagel. A little bagel. Definitely taste the vinegar in there. I like that. Yeah, it has a little vinegar. Mm -hmm. It's been fermented. It's got some honey. That would work well on a salad as well. Yeah. Well, I also made uh, some. Got a little heat. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Ba -boom. So this was with the hotter red peppers and the jalapeno. So the Mad Hatter, the jalapeno, and some of the other. Um, this right here, I did the same thing, but it was with um, the banana peppers. Um, and so I actually did make a salad dressing out of this. So this is, I'm gonna use this for salad dressing. Not as hot, I'm assuming. Mm -mm. Okay, cool. Um, I fixed you a little salad again. Yeah, so this is our microgreens that we've been dead into heating us some microgreens. And some of those Good are clean actually yep. left from last week. That's how long they last. See there, this is a, a, uh, a mix of microgreens with some baby lettuces that we're growing indoors right now. And we're gonna put a little tomato on them. I still have a few tomatoes left. Cool. Get it out of there. Your little wooden bowl's holding your tomatoes. There you go. Mm -hmm. And we got some pecans. No, oh, that's some, meat there. Some 
steak you grilled last night and some parjon. And then that's the salad dressing. Everything in here except the meat and the cheese is ours, right? Mm-hmm. So this is good, clean eating, folks. And then we're gonna put some of that nice pepper salad dressing on there. Baboon. There we have that. Must I try? Must you try? Must I try? So we're talking about soil building blocks, soil. Now the very first thing we want to talk about, and this is not sexy by no means. And a lot of people don't want to follow through with this, soil samples. Mm -hmm. When's the best time to do the soil sample? Anytime you can. Mm -hmm. You know, used to, we always thought we had to do soil samples in the fall of the year. And it is a good time to do it in the fall of the year because you can set yourself up for the spring. You can figure on about three months time from when you apply something in your soil as a lime for it to take effect. So. Any time of year is a good time to do a soil sample. You want to apply that lime whenever you need it. It doesn't matter. It's not heat sensitive or anything like that. But we normally do it in the time of year when we don't have a whole lot going on. I need to do my raised beds. How's that? That's delish. There's even some uh, garlic, the flowers from the garlic chives hmm. that might, might have made it to the bottom. That's good. So the other things to help your soil, we're just gonna touch on. As always, we preach just cover crops. Cover crops. Rotation. Yep. Rotation. Um, and amend. And amend. So if you've been in this situation before where you thought you had dead soils, a dead soil is a compacted kind of a hard soil. And if you've had trouble getting things to grow in there, there's definitely some things you could do. As we said, start with your soil sample. Soil sample, the main things you want to measure in your soil sample is phosphorus levels, mm -hmm. potassium levels, and pH. A lot of people get the thought process that they can measure their nitrogen soil sample. Soil samples do not measure nitrogen. Now, they will also measure cation exchange value which, and organic matter in your soil. A lot of times, these are additional tests that you can get done with your soil sample. I would probably recommend just doing a routine soil test to start with, unless you're getting more advanced. Mm -hmm. So your phosphorus level, your potassium levels are very important to know, and then your pH. First thing you want to do is adjust, 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 adjust that pH. You can do that by raising it with lime or lowering it with elemental sulfur. As we have said many, many times, do not ever apply lime unless you know what your pH is because reversing that effect of what the lime does is troublesome and it's uh, very hard to do with elemental sulfur. It's possible, but it's tough. It's not near as easy to lower the pH as it is to raise it. And um, that's the most bang for the buck you can do. Lime's cheap. But to get that pH in line, normally speaking for vegetables around a 6.5 is what you want. And what that does, it makes all your nutrients available to that plant. So let's just say, for instance, that we had a 7.2 or 7.3 pH, or we had a 5.5 pH, extremes on both ends. A lot of our minor elements could be tied up and not available to the plant. Now they're in the soil, but they're tied up and they're not available to the plant. So regardless of what you do, you're not going to be successful unless that pH is in line. Hmm. It's good, huh? That's very good. So, pH, phosphorus, and potassium. You got that down pat. That's your routine soil test. Your potassium, it's good to know what your levels are there, but it's more important to probably know what your phosphorus levels are. Phosphorus is, you cannot reduce phosphorus but one way, and that's to farm it off, to grow it off. Potassium is somewhat soluble. It'll move a little bit. Phosphorus is not. So, if we do have a plot, we have a very large phosphorus level in, well that tells you that's a great place to put your corn next year. Those little things like that's going to make a big difference with growing different crops and different plots and adjusting all that and understanding what your nutrient load is in your in your garden area. You can kind of work with that. So um, um, what have you done to amend yours this year? To amend mine this year I've worked cover crops in hard, I've added compost in 
And uh, that's pretty much a standard thing that I do all the time. Now, another thing you could do on your soil test, if you really want to get complicated, is you can test your cation exchange value. And some of your routine tests may have this on there. It's cation exchange value, B C E C. And that shows the, how well your soil will hold nutrients and also your organic matter. Now, here in the South where we live, we strive for a four to five percent organic matter load in our soil and it is very hard for us to maintain that but that is what we strive for now i was in iowa two weeks ago and i was visiting a farm up there a little small market farm and i was talking to the lady because she had really good crops and really good soils and i asked her about adding compost and she says i don't add compost because i can't get good quality compost i said wow that's that's unusual I said, what is your organic matter in your soil? She said it runs anywhere from 8 to 10%. Oh, wow. So an 8 to 10% here in the south we live is unheard of. But that guys up in that part of the country up there easily maintain those types of organic matter in the soil. So they do things a little different than we do. So how do they maintain that without adding compost? They really don't have to. I they mean, just it's, just, it's just there. It's a different climate than what we would have here Uh it's just a different type of soil and different climate. Our soils seem to be more sandier down here, and we have a lot more heat for a longer period of time, and it burns that organic matter out every year. So if we do apply compass, compass, is that a word? A lot. If we do <laughs> allow, I mean, apply a lot of compost, which I do, it burns it up. Mm -hmm. the sun, which is heat, will burn it up. Mm. So, you know, and a lot of these people up in Alaska practice this no-till thing, well, no-till may work in certain areas of the country, but not necessarily work in all areas of the country. It would be hard-pressed for us to make it work in our neck of the woods down here. Cover crops, till those in, great for adding organic matter to soil, great for keeping the microbes going in soil, feeding those earthworms. It's a great process. Mm -hmm. So if you have those dead soils that we talked about earlier, first thing, get you a good soil test and then after that what you want to do is you want to break it up and you want to add air to the soil because good living soil has to have air transfer it has to transfer oxygen and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide so how does that work with these no-till guys that can be so they their intention is to layer they want to layer on top of one another to increase the microbial activity of the soil and therefore it goes down and works down into the soil. Mm. So they're just forming that top layer? They're just forming the top layer and letting it rework uh, the bottom soils down through there, which can be a little bit of a slower process than what I'm talking about. When we go in there and mechanically work that soil up and add those amendments in there, it can be a little bit quicker. You are changing the structure of the soil somewhat. And that can be a good thing. So the no-till guys, they don't want to change the structure of their soil over a short term. They want to do it over a really long term period of time. Going there and mechanically doing it, adding that air, fluffing it up and adding that organic matter will change that structure a lot quicker. Mm. Can you over-till? Oh, absolutely. And I've been guilty of that. If you work those soils too much, especially with the tiller, you will deplete the tip of the soil tip. and you will cause yourself some problems. When you pick up soil, you want it kind of clumpy and you want it alive. If you pick it up and it just runs out of your hand there, then more likely you have reduced or damaged the tip of your soil. I got some friends of mine that have done that. Mm -hmm. And they ask me every year, what's wrong with my soil? And I tell them and they don't want to listen to me <laughs> because they enjoy running a tiller through there, cleaning up their garden. They use that tiller with it behind a tractor or whether it's a handheld, that's their primary way of working that, that garden up and keeping it clean. But it, it's detrimental to the soil over a period of time. What about these big farmers that run these cultivators through? Yeah, they use a lot of hair disc. Now, a hair disc is different from a tiller. Oh. And it's, it's not near as bad on the soil as a tiller is. A tiller actually beats it to death. A hair disc will go in there and actually cut, cut it, through. and it cuts that organic matter up and helps for it to degrade quicker. So if I have a preference between the tiller and the hair, I always use a hair because it's a lot better on the tilt for the soil. We have our hair disc back in stock. We do have a hair disc back in stock for our wheel hose, yep. Mm -hmm. So 
Aerate your soils, get organic matter into your soils. If you got clay type soils, you can use gypsum to help break the structure of your soil up and make it looser like that. But there again, good compost would do it as well. I am a huge believer in good compost applications of the soil. But what trouble do we have with that? Contamination. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people um, reporting that they got contaminated compost. It really killed off the vegetables. A lot of YouTubers out there have experienced this within the last year or two. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for probably about 20 years. Uh, I remember about 20 something years ago, I read an article and actually the first documented case of it, if I'm not mistaken, was up in Washington State. And it was from compost contamination of copper lead. And we're going to talk about copper lead in just a minute. But what was happening is the lawn companies that spray your lawns were applying copper lead as a weed control up in Washington State on some of these cool season turf grasses. And the county or the city was collecting those clippings. Grass clippings. Oh, and they wow. were composting them. And they found that that chemical did not break down and it actually caused a lot of problems. That was the first evidence of it. And since then, we found some more problems. I don't think I have ever had contaminated compost in in any of my stuff because I've always been fairly selective about what I use. But I have seen corpure lead. I have seen some of these herbicide damages in landscapes before, and I know exactly what it looks like. I can spot contaminated compost, evidence of that growing in a garden. I can spot those plants 20, 30 feet off. What it's they just look like? Well, here's what they look like. We've got a picture here showing what they look like. Most of the time, the plants are still really green, but it's twisted up, and the telltale sign is that leaf curled up. Mm. The way we used to see it, and if there's any of you master gardeners out there that get like they give garden advice to other people, maybe you make site visits, and you get there to a site, and you see these plants that are gnarled up, and the cup of the leaf is cup upwards, 99% of the time, it is a herbicide damage. Sometimes, homeowners will actually spray weed control in their garden that somebody may have given them or they're not completely understanding what they sprayed and it will cause damage. The way you get around this is, is you never ask the homeowner what they sprayed. Because us in general, we don't like to uh, admit, we admit our mistakes. Up, yeah. So you can't come right out and ask them, this is what you have to do and I've done this numerous times. I walk out there and I see herbicide damage. Whether it and I've seen it in gardens before too, and I say, Man, your weed control is really good. What do you use to spray your weeds? You start <laughs> bragging them. Oh, I, I sprayed this stuff, I got it. So a friend gave it to me, it's a forester or whatever. I got it in my in my utility room, I'll show it to you. You go over and look at it, and I pick it up, and I looked at it bad and ready, and I know exactly what happened there. Seen it many, many times before. They'll be sprayed a, a chemical that a farmer gave them or a forestry chemical that somebody gave them. Works really good, cleans it up, but there's what's the root of the damage. So it you can't around. come out and ask them, you, sp you sprayed something wrong here, and they're they gonna fight you on that all the time. So let's talk about contamination of compost. One of the YouTubers that I saw, she used the same compost that she's used for years, and this was the first year she had issues with it. Mm -hmm and tracing it back to the manufacturer, they used some different ingredients this year. Oh, it was store-bought. Mm -hmm, store-bought, because they had some trouble getting supplies in. Hmm. And, wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So the three main contaminants of compost we're gonna go over here. Now, I actually, during my research, I found some information out there that I don't think is exactly right. I've I seen, you gotta be real careful where you get your information from. There were some websites out there that claimed some other chemicals also contaminated soil, such as triclopyr and 2,4-D. Never in my time have I ever seen triclopyr or 2,4-D contaminate compost. Now, I've seen plants die from drift of it, but I've never seen residential effects in the compost. But we're going to go over three of them right here that I know for a fact is the main culprits of contaminated compost. And the first one is corpyrolead. 
And you'll see here the active ingredients up there in red. Now that what you see down below is in black is the trade names that this product comes in. Now this is primarily used as a lawn herbicide. So if you have a lawn co uh, care company spray in your lawn, or you may have bought one of the, uh, some of this chemical and applied it yourself, this particular herbicide is the only one that I'm familiar used in the lawn industry that will carry over through the compost and damage your mm -hmm. plants. Now the primary plants that are damaged with any of these three contaminants are the ones in your nightshade family. Your peppers, your eggplants, and your tomatoes. Now, they really don't do much harm to brassicas and any of your monocots, such as your corn, anything like that, they're not gonna damage them. But they will. Not tomatoes. Shady. Tomatoes are the worst one. So copperlia, lawn contamination, saving the grass clips, that's the one you need to be concerned about right there. The next one is more of a pasture herbicide. It also is used in some right of ways um, and other applications, but primarily it's used in spraying hay fields. And it's called pickle ram. Pickle ram. Now pickle ram is one ingredient that's in one of the Grazon Plus P, the old chemical called Grazon Plus P, that causes damage. Now pickle ram is used for what? It's used to spray hay fields for weeds. So if you take the hay from a hay field that was sprayed with pickle ram and mulch with it and mulch with it or you fed it to your animal and animal manure is contaminated with it, it will carry over even through the manure or through the composting process. Yes. I know that's hard to believe. I've seen it with my own so eyes. So if you buy hay from a third party and you don't know what's on it. You're setting yourself up for trouble if you try to compost. Exactly. Or if you buy hay and you feed it to your That's horse and you save the horse manure and put it in your garden, it can carry over that far as well. Mm. Pickle ram, I don't, I don't, as far as I know, it's not used in the lawn care industry. It's only used in the forestry and mainly in hay fields. And there below that is some of the trade names, but it's also in Grazon Plus P. Here's a new one here that I'm not as familiar with. Mm, can you pronounce that? Yes, I can. <laughs> Aminopyrlid. Aminopyrlid. This is a newer chemical that has come out that also we have found carries over and does a lot of contamination in compost. Now this is used in some of your new products of Grazon. Uh, Grazon Next, I believe, has this product in there. And you can see in the black below some more of the uh, trade names this is. This is primarily was, let me back up. This was primarily when it was first developed used as a forestry chemical to, to spray forestry land to take out undesirable broadleaves. Uh, however, it has been started, people started using it in hay as well. It's not used in lawn care that I'm aware of, but primarily forestry and for hay. Same thing, it will carry over through the manure of the animal if you apply it to your garden, or if the hay is took off of it and composted, it will pass through both ways and cause major, major damage. All three of these, the damage looks the same. This curling leaf right here, so you cannot look at a curl, a contaminated compost vegetable that's grown in there that's having issues. You can't look at that and tell which one of these it was because they all three are the same. Mm. So let me ask you this, what about Roundup? Does it stay in the soil and no, hurt the No, no. Plants? Roundup, within three days, if you spray Roundup on your soil, you need to wait three days, and after three days you can replant there. It has no res residual there. Now, some people may argue that it has health benefit problems. I'm not getting into that argument. I'm just simply telling you what the it, replant time it's is. It's out of the it's out, it's out of the soil. As far as the plant's concerned, you're not going to see any damage to any plants if you wait three days. Most of these chemicals out there have a half-life that degrades rather quickly. These three that I just mentioned right here have very unique modes of action that hang around for a long, long period of time. Now let's just say that you do get some of this in there and you do contaminate your garden. What do you do? Flush it out. Well, you could remove the soil, which is going to be very expensive and very time consuming to do and put new soil down there. That's one way. 
it's not my be my favorite way. The next thing you could do, which is not going to be necessarily what you want to hear, is you could add good compost to kind of dilute the soil out a little bit. Add something such as biochar. Biochar is a it's basically it's charcoal, but it's very fine. You can add that, and that's kind of a sponge. It's known to pull up the contaminants mm -hmm. out of the soil. What about sunflowers? Sunflowers. Don't they take? Would work somewhat. Yeah, sunflowers work. They, you might still see some damage there, but that would be a good one. And that's what I would say next is start growing crops out there that would pull that contamination out and weaken it. Those would be corns, brassicas. And possibly sunflowers. That's a good one. I didn't think about that. Yeah. You want to stay away from anything in the nightshade family. For a couple of years, it's going to be a long process, and it'll gradually weaken down and, and degrade, and you can get back to normal. And you've learned your lesson by then. Yeah. No one, of the, one of the YouTubers in her high tunnel, that's what she's doing, is planting sunflowers. Yep. And then start with your crop rotation where you cover crops and get everything working back together there. Soil is the foundation for you being successful growing your garden. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Sounds good. Yep. So we have got strawberries that we are pre-selling. Channel strawberries. We have got German white garlic that we are pre-selling. And we also now have elephant garlic yeah. on the side that we're pre-selling. So the strawberries are scheduled for delivery. Oh man, you put me on the spot here. In October, right? Yeah, yeah, in October. And I think we're going to have the garlics in uh, September, I hope, if I'm Correct on that. So if you order them, they're going to go in a pre-order queue and won't be shipped out till later. Mm -hmm. um, we do expect to sell out on all three of those. So. Yeah. We've had some uh, complaints about the strawberries. You're not selling them to very many states. You want to address why? Well, that's a good point. <laughs> We're limited on what we could get, and we're also concerned about shipping distance. So we don't like to say California, for instance. I don't think it's pertinent for us at this time to be selling strawberry shipping a long distance time because we can have some damage in transit. Sometimes UPS can be a little bit slower than what they say they're going to be. So we try to anticipate the transit time so that your plants arrive nice, safely, and healthy. So that's one reason. Next thing is, we're limited on our supply. Yeah. So we're trying to take care of our neighboring states to start with and then uh, go from there. Years come forward, we may do things a little bit different. We're trying to expand a little bit every year, but that's kind of the thing. If you live in the South, plant elephant garlic. If you want to try the German white, if you live in the deep South, you can try it. Sometimes you can be successful with it. But if you live in some of the Northern or intermediate states up there, say Tennessee or wherever, you can do great with uh, German white. But if you're in one of these southern states and you really want to be successful, grow that elephant garlic. Elephant garlic. Yep. I agree. I had somebody this morning talk about elephant garlic, talking about the uh, maturity time. I will tell you this. I normally plant my elephant garlic the same time I plant my onions, around the mm -hmm. 1st of November. Normally speaking, my elephant garlic comes off, matures off about two weeks after my onions do in the spring. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. What about the old goat? Old goat. We didn't have a lot of comments on the old goat last week. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. now you reckon you had trouble finding the old goat? May have. All right, so here we draw for old goat. If you found the old goat and you put it in the comments, we will draw your name the following show, and we will send you a gift. Tony S. Can you see that right there? Tony S. Tony, send us your shipping address to Custer at hosstools.com and we will send you a coveted gift because Tony S, you found the old goat and you put it in the comments last week. So check around and see if you can find it. If you do, let us know and you will be in the drawing. Well, Hostinator contest ends August 31st. 31st. If you grew our Hostinators this year and you grew a big one, need a picture on the scales with the Hostinator pack, send it in also to customer service at hosstools.com to be eligible for the largest hostinator. You, you will get bragging rights and a $100 gift certificate from Hoss Tools. Garden update of the week. How about that? How about that? This week, we're talking about Gary Courtright. Yep, and Gary is in Nevada. Of all places, now we're just talking about 
growing your own foods is challenging soils, but Gary's got challenging soils and environment in Nevada, and he's it's, pulling it off. So it's been 100 to 110, mm -hmm. man drought yep so let's look at his garden here now he started out nine years ago back in 2013 with a small 16 by 16 spot like we all did he started out small it kind of grew and grew like you should do mm -hmm. and now he's added these raised beds a couple years ago and you know what they're extremely neat to me the way he did it i like the height i like the height of them too but he's in the bottom he's dealing with some challenging environments there so he also put drip irrigation in them. He said that his water pressure, and we deal with this sometimes, was over 100 PSI. So he had to work with the system to make his drip irrigation work in his irrigation beds. Had to have drip irrigation in that environment. Mm -hmm. Had to have it. But look at the black raised beds. Mm -hmm. Look at those arches. I mean, the trellis system. Trellises, yeah. Neat. So go check uh, Gary out. And thanks, Gary, for sending in your pictures. Absolutely. What do you call a rabbit that's been wet by the garden hose? A wet rabbit. No. What? A hairspray. Okay. We had people uh, guess our joke last week. Really? Yeah. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. What was the answer to it? Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny, yeah. All right, folks, thank you for joining us. Hope you got some inspiration, some insight on building your soul for so you can be successful growing your own food. Now it's time for you to get off that couch and get dirty.